Great. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Planning, Economic Development, and Housing uh, April uh, Committee meeting. The, today is April 7th, and we are um, broadcasting, streaming uh, live uh, on Comcast and Frontier Government Channel 96 and 6032. We're also streaming via hpatv.org and uh, HPA TV Facebook, HBA TV Roku TV, Apple TV, Amazon TV apps. So please join us if you're not able to stay with us the entire evening. You can also go to HBA TV YouTube channel and um, finish watching the program. So again, good evening and welcome to the April 7th. Uh, PDNH uh, committee meeting. Uh, with us this evening, we have members. We have uh, Councilman Marilyn Rossetti, uh, Councilman Josh Mitchum, uh, Councilman Nick LeBron, not a voting member, but he's also a welcome member. And we also have with us today, we have Aaron Howard, our economic development person from the Pe development and service. Uh, who else do we have here? I'm going to all the screenshots I have. Ah, I'm sorry, Councilman Gale. Good evening, uh, Councilman Gale, uh, our esteemed member. Uh, trying to see what else do we have with us. Oh, we also have our uh, de development, uh, development director, deputy, um, Mr. Randall. Uh, Randall, the last name, please. Davis. I'm going to- Davis. You know, Randall, I'm, you know, I'm having one of these senior moments. Um, and who else do we have visiting with us tonight? And I believe our attorney, Mr. Uh, Richard Velasso. And I think I'm we... Here. Good, evening. I'm, good evening, sir. And thank you very much for um, spending a small amount of your evening with us tonight. So we only have two items, which is, which is a really wonderful thing. Um, we're gonna be doing for you committee members and members of our audience. We have two presentation from two developments that's going on within our city. And it is really nice to get an opportunity to share with everyone uh, an update on the development that is going on within our city. So um, the, the two presentations we have, uh, the first person up is going to be uh, from Shelbourne uh, corporation, uh, uh, Mr. Michael Seinfeld, and he's going to give us an update on what's going on on Pratt Street. You know, as the weather warms up like it was beautiful today, it is great to hear some of the wonderful things that have been taking place and will be taking place uh, in our city. Uh, so, Mr. Um, Seinfeld, welcome, sir, and thank you very much for your time for being with us tonight. Thank you very much, uh, Councilwoman, and I appreciate being invited to this committee and uh, having the opportunity to have this um, share share with the committee and with the council members um, some of the plans that have been in the works for well over two, almost three years by now. And um, <clears throat> truthfully, this is a little overdue um, and uh, I apologize that we haven't had the opportunity to do so earlier. Um, as many of you know, uh, Shelbourne together with Laz Parking and Lexington Partners have um, joined in partnership in a redevelopment project on Pratt Street. There's been a lot of talk about it. We've gone before the CRDA and there's been some press. However, if you walk down the street right now, you still would not see anything different than from the past 40 years. That's not because we've been sleeping. Um, uh, we have been working very uh, hard on multiple levels of which I am really excited to share with you tonight. So there's a lot of content that I wanna show with you. So I'm gonna be sharing my screen because a lot of it is very visual. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna try to be as concise because I know timing is important. And I just, um, there are multiple perspectives that I'm gonna cover tonight. So um, I wanna give the opportunity to anybody who has questions or comments or feedback to do so. But I just ask if you, uh, give me the um, opportunity to first give you the full picture uh, because this is really a been uh, what I'm going to share with you now is really two to three years of work. Um, the pandemic has pushed us back in terms of launching, but we are, I would say, weeks away 
at this point, and I'll talk about timing as well. So I'm just going to jump right into it, and I'm going to assume nothing. Uh, I'm just going to cover some of the base. I'm going to start to share my screen. Sure. And uh, just let me know if you are able to see my yes. screen now. Yes, we are seeing it. Okay. So um, as we know, Pratt Street um, is the heart and soul of the downtown, a very important artery uh, that has so much history, character. And one thing is for sure, Hartford does not lack in passion and local uh, connection. So we're very cognizant of that. And uh, one thing is for sure, we're very sensitive to the fact that it's a, um, Hartford is a community driven city and Pratt Street all the more so. So we need to go about reactivating, rediscovering and re-energizing Pratt Street with, with a lot of sensitivity, a lot of collaboration, which we have been doing with many people on the street and uh, in different areas. So first of all, what are we discussing? So this slide over here, this is just an aerial view of the part that is part of this project that Shelbourne and its partners own. And it starts from 196 Trumbull and it wraps around 99, which is obviously the main corner piece. And it goes down to 55 Pratt. So when you look at the entire Pratt Street, I don't know if this is, between 25% to a third. Uh, obviously this parking lot and, um, and the uh, society room over here, that's owned by Conover. And we all know the Northern side is owned by Northland. We um, as a uh, felt, we're not gonna, you know, we, we, uh, we own enough to start ignition, to start the redevelopment project and to change the narrative and the vibe and the energy on the street. And if we rise, we all rise together. If we sink, unfortunately, we all sink together. So um, we, we feel comfortable that just with this piece alone, we can, um, we can influence and, and reposition this street. Now, it's not just about Pratt Street. It's obviously, uh, as we all know, it's about the entire downtown, the entire city, but we have to start somewhere. And, um, and the idea over here was to start over here. And this is uh, just, again, an aerial view. Over here, you'll see just the um, elevation of what, which the buildings that we're talking about on Pratt when you face south. And this is how the buildings look currently. Um, they have been neglected. They have not been kept up for many, many, many years. And what work uh, plans call for is the key word, which, oh, over here, I'm sorry, we're, I'm just going to uh, go around to Trumbull. This is 196 Trumbull, and uh, this is, again, 99, as you all know. The key word over here is restore. We're here to restore and recapture the charm, architectural beauty, and the character of the street to its full potential in a way that resonates with millennials and the young generation and locals, but in a way that also celebrates and respects and honors our history. And these are just renderings of the cleaned up version of what it could look when it's activated, cleaned up with, uh, with we're not blowing out any of the facades besides for the fact that we can't, we don't even want to. Um, over here, this is what a restored um, 196 and 99 facing Trumbull could look like. Uh, that's a far cry from the way it looks over here, which is not as inviting. And, um, and this is just a floor plan of, of, of what we're discussing. And obviously the green or the vacant, unfortunately, Max Bebos has also gone vacant throughout COVID so that this would have to be updated. But this is just a, 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 a basic, what are we discussing over here? Now, what I would like to show you is, um, give me a moment. Okay. One of the things that's really important is when we look at Pratt Street, we need to look at Pratt Street as part of a whole, a whole district and a whole community. It's not just one street. And on the south side of Pratt, you have Asylum Street. And Asylum Street right now is just looking at the back side of Pratt. And this is just a, on the left side, you can see a, an image of that. Not inviting and totally dead. In fact, it's really uh, fronted by a parking lot. And 
one of the uh, uh, things that we were looking at to do is how can we activate the rear side of Pratt Street that can bring greater value to Pratt Street and Asylum. And the idea was, if uh, this is just what you could see over here, the purple, that's our property line. And we can only work with what we own. But the idea was if we were to clean up the backside and create a back patio, number one, this would give additional outside seating for any restaurant or food operators or anything like that. Secondly, it would help in the activation of asylum. You're walking down asylum, now you hear tinkling and clinks of glass. You hear patrons. We can have bistro lighting in the back and stuff like that. And this is just another render of what it could look like. I will just share, just to share with the committee how we like to think. Not always is it as practical for a phase one, but this is a goal we have. Right now, if you want to access, you know, we talk a lot about mobility, accessibility, especially pedestrian. Right now, the only way to get to Pratt Street is either through Main or Trumbull Streets. We're, we did a few studies to look into creating a passageway through one of the retail stores, taking a retail store and creating a passageway, pedestrian passageway, that would bring connectivity from the middle of Pratt Street into asylum. Now, again, um, we don't own uh, the parking lot, so obviously there's issues with that. Additionally, there's some feasibility issues, but we ha um, this is like a, a wish list that we have still committed to. We have a few other studies that we're looking at, but we understand and we are committed to bringing greater foot traffic connectivity, a greater sense of discovery and community where we could integrate Pratt Street even more than the way it currently is right now. Now, right now, the way Pratt Street has been uh, for all these past years is every retail store has basically put up, you know, whatever signage they, they want. And there's no sense of place. There's no sense of district and there's a lack of sense of history. And we spent a lot of time and I'm only showing you a portion of this just to give you a sense and I'm glad to share more offline is we need to create as a landlord, again, we could only control um, the, 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 the buildings that we own, but we need to create a standard of design, both exterior and interior so that the pedestrian experience is such that Pratt Street becomes a destination where it's unique, it's special. It's something which, you, you know, we don't want a Starbucks because that you could get anywhere around America. We want boutique, unique retail experiences that the only place you can get that on is Pratt Street. So people from uh, other neighborhoods or other suburbs will want to come down. And in order to do that, we still have to give retail owners the flexibility to have their own creativity and their own brand, but we need to give them, and this is very common in malls and in other themed um, um, environments. So we put together, and this is intended for uh, re new retail tenants and our current retail tenants, guidelines of design with precedent imagery of exterior, so, and, and there's a lot of imagery here and it gives you, um, you know, storefront, outdoor signage, um, areas, of, of zones of design of where you could put signage, where you can't put signage, signage do's and the red is don'ts because that detracts from the sense of place, glass applications, do's and don'ts, awnings, um, outdoor furniture, what kind of character we're looking for, um, again, how much, what, you know, giving basic guidelines. And this goes very detailed. It goes into interior signage because we want when patients come inside, they also feel that sense of experience and discovery that they want to come there and stay there. You know, again, interior signage, do's and don'ts, blade signs. And then we go into the interior and this goes very detailed. What kind of fixtures, again, do's and don'ts, menu boards, back of house, wall finishings. I'm just gonna fly through this, floor finishings, ceiling finishes, lighting, um, further lighting uh, um, information. Now, obviously this is, um, this is all historic, 
right? This is a uh, historic, and and I uh, we've already discussed. I've already shared this with um, with uh, Amy Chambers and the Historic Commission, and uh, we're doing a lot of that work to to work around that as well, and make sure that we're respecting that. But uh, this is a, a whole different level to create that sense of place and that sense of, of discovery, both inside the stores and outside the stores. And we're gonna be working with each retail to implement this and to create this kind of look and feel. We have a whole approval process, a design approval process, how it's gonna work. And I'm not gonna go into all the many details, but I just wanna show you um, uh, the committee, um, you know, the direction we're going in. Now, um, all this is wonderful, uh, however, we uh, understand that marketing and branding and public perception and creating vibe and excitement is absolutely critical for this to be successful because, especially because we're coming off a pandemic and especially because Parastreet has lain, uh, um, you know, without this kind of renewal for so many years, people are, are hesitant, people are, are skeptical. So we're about to embark on a full-fledged all-out marketing campaign. The first thing we're doing is we're creating a Pratt Street District website. The Pratt Street District website is not just for Shelbourne. It's for the entire district of Pratt Street, whether you're on the Shelbourne building, whether you're in Northland, whether you're in Asylum, it doesn't matter. We need to speak as one voice. I'm going to share with you the the website now this website is not live yet it's in the middle of being coded so uh it's not public however it's pretty close so you could see we came up with a new logo for pratt street it honors the brick it honors the we call this hipster vintage or vintage hipster we're not, i'm not seeing it michael not I'm seeing sorry. it not no we're not seeing it Oh, I apologize. Okay. Let's see. Do you see it now? Is Can you see my screen now? Yes. Is it... yes. Yes. Yep. Yep. yes, we can. Great. Okay. So we created this new um, um, uh, logo uh, to give an identity uh, for Pratt Street. And the whole look and feel is on the one hand, we want to stay respectful of the vintage feel, the character, but at the same time be hipster and be welcoming. And over here, we're gonna have, uh, um, you know, all the information, all the fun, all the uh, events that's going on on Pratt Street, we're gonna put up over here. Um, we have even created this um, character, we haven't named him yet, but as, a, as almost like a maitre d', as the host of the street, uh, uh, welcome to Pratt Street, rediscover Pratt Street. It's historic, charming, spirit and local. And I'd be more than happy to share this with you so you could read it more in detail. And there's so much to do when you're down in Pratt Street. And um, so I'm gonna just jump very quickly. Uh, we have over here a restored Pratt Street. And over here, it talks about the, pro about our, about the project, okay? About the overall project. Uh, we have over here a 200 year history and that talks about, and it's not working now because it's still in the middle of being built. Oh, you can see it over here, sorry. It talks about the history of Pratt Street. And in addition to a timeline, we also gonna have, we found vintage imagery. Um, uh, this, is, this is actually um, Main Street. Uh, when you're looking down, this is uh, uh, Pratt Street. So we, have a, we, we found in the archives actually, a, a, uh, CHS uh, has in their archives. So we, we, we purchased that. And that's very interesting to people who want to know more about the history. And then uh, over here we have visit. So on the visit, uh, we have over here, um, you know, the map and the location by, by things. Again, the, the, the site's not completed, but it's going to be broken down by food, by entertainment, by things to do. Um, then we have something which is really important, which is the merchant directory. Okay, so some, um, uh, you'll, you'll recognize this councilman, uh, Gail, where this was taken, but um, over here we have a merchant directory and this is for all merchants 
uh, we're on the Pratt Street district, um, and we'll be able to promote them as a unit, as one voice. No one cares who owns which building when they walk down Pratt Street. If we don't, we, we, we didn't finish. Uh, there's going to be much more coming on. But in addition, if someone's having a promotion, there's a grand opening, someone's having a sale, instead of them just relying on themselves, we have a very powerful tool now to, to push Pratt Street as a district as a whole. And uh, over here, we're going to have all the events and we're working very closely. I'm going to talk about this in a minute with the bid and others. And over here is where we're going to put on all the practically specific events and uh, stuff that's going on. Leasing, if you want to do retail leasing or residential leasing, because I didn't talk about the residential, but residential, um, we have residential units at 196 Trumbull, which is the upward living. And over here, you can have information about that. And if you, a uh, 99 Pratt Street, which we're about to start construction um, to, to uh, convert that into 97 units of studio and one bedroom units. So that construction will be beginning in the next few weeks and uh, pre-leasing will start in about six to seven months. And uh, this is an actual, um, this is how, how the inside is actually going to look. You know, rendering of the design of the inside. Um, and but again, there's going to be more imagery, but the site's not fully functional yet at this point. And we're going to add the other buildings as they become available. We have the blog, gallery, where we have images and, and news and, um, and news about Pratt Street. So this is, uh, um, this is what, what, what this component is going to be about. However, even this is not sufficient because very nice, we have a beautiful website, but a website alone is not going to uh, change, uh, it's is not enough. So one of the things that, one of the things that we um, uh, have been working on and we're uh, hoping to launch this within the next two to three weeks is we have a local company, Lumi Agency, some of you may be familiar, they're local to Hartford, they actually used to, uh, uh, be located on, on Pratt Street. Um, and we have a full launch and brand rollout and marketing for Pratt Street. It's going to start within the next two, three weeks. And it's going to initially go over the spring, summer, and fall season. And, you know, number one, the timing is really crucial because we're entering, you know, we're crawling out of post COVID. Things are starting to ease up, thank God. Um, the weather's turning nice and people are eager to get back. Now's a great time for when people are taking a new fresh look and saying, what's new in Hartford and to roll this out. But I'm just going to zip through this because it's a long presentation and, and I know timing is, is important. So the first thing that we're doing is a, is a, is a, is um, events and programming. So the Hartford bid uh, led by Jordan does incredible work and we uh, speak to her all the time. Um, we're working with her not only to uh, bring greater marketing firepower, but to also add and expand our reach into the marketing and programming over the spring, summer, and fall. And here's a bunch of different ideas. I'm not gonna go through each one specifically at this point, but there's a, there's a whole list of different ideas, immersive art exhibits, uh, pop-ups, different uh, art uh, uh, experiences, retail uh, uh, um, uh, marketplaces, working with existing retailers and events to work with them to collaborate, signage ideas, murals on vacant storefronts and how to activate them. I know uh, some of the council members on here, we've discussed this privately, but this is exactly where it's at. And we are spending a lot of time working with all those who already are doing events to eliminate as many blind spots and redundancies as possible so we can include what they're doing on the, on every on all our marketing so that we're aligned and we bring greater uh, effectiveness and as much as as possible um, in addition to all this in addition to all this we've also um, starting local and regional PR strategy which includes a media outreach plan um, which includes uh, strategic partnerships 
to work in, in alignment with all of these different uh, uh, partnerships. Um, and again, a media outreach plan, influencer marketing plan, bringing down influencers and bl bloggers so that they can, on their social media feed, marketing and promotional strategy, the, this includes email and advertising um, and blog content. I'm, I'm just showing you, I'm, I'm zipping through this, but uh, guest writer strategy, social media, uh, and all this kind of stuff. So it's, it's quite detailed and uh, we're ready to, to launch this very, very soon. And obviously there's a lot of different things that all have to come together in, in one shot. I know that um, some of you uh, may have seen this uh, book that we put together. This is specifically for um, Rediscovering Retail. You able to see my screen? Yes. So this is specifically speaking to attract new retail with our leasing team and um, uh, specifically for, for, you know, and it, it, it talks about the development, the vision. And then it says, you know, straight up, why Hartford? Why downtown Hartford? And these are all stats that we, we actually reached out to all of these uh, venues and got these stats. Obviously, this is all for pre-COVID. And we are certainly confident that we're going to recapture this level post-COVID, but to see these numbers in your face is pretty powerful. It talks about the business community. It talks about if the current growth, uh, expanding residential market, which is very, very important. And then why Pratt Street itself? And it speaks about, uh, uh, you know, it's the center of downtown, the iconic shops, and we highlight some of the iconic shops over here and about all the parties that go on. Now, one of the things which is important to understand is and again, this is pre-COVID and God willing, post-COVID. So as we all know, Shelbourne does own four uh, biz, um, Class A towers within one to three blocks walking up Pratt Street. We have an internal um, app uh, and ways that we connect with, with our tenants. So on a full day, we can have thousands of people, workers, day workers in these buildings. We plan on bringing this synergy between what's happening on Pratt Street and this, this daytime population to, to break that uh, blind spot, that disconnect that has always been there. That Pratt Street should be able to thrive off of this, you know, come over the weekend, there's a special, there's a grand opening, there's an event and stuff like that. And we plan on bringing that synergy all together. And over here, we talk about the retail opportunities that's available. And over here, here's the block plan. And, and you know, that's, that's the idea over here. I do want to just say that, I do just want to say, um, I've reached out to every, I think almost every single uh, shop owner, property owner, or whoever has a stake in the general Pratt Street district. And I've shared a lot of this with them because the last thing I would want is that people who have been here for 20 years wake up one day to find that uh, uh, all this is happening. This is uh, their street. It's not Shelbourne Street. It's their street. We want everyone to obviously succeed. And I've made this presentation, whoever, um, I'm, gonna, I'm scheduling a second presentation and their feedback so that communication, collaboration and eliminating blind spots is something that's personally very important to me. Um, I've had the honor of sharing this with parts of this with the mayor, I don't know, maybe two, three months ago and I, Charles, who's on as well. Um, his words were, this is transformative. Those, those were his words. And that's certainly our, our goal. I will end off with one thing. I start off by saying that this is only the beginning. I know a lot of us talk about marketing and marketing and marketing. I will say that Shelbourne has just made a commitment for 12 months on our own dime to market the entire city of Hartford and to reposition Hartford as a destination lifestyle of arts and cultural Mecca in the Northeast. Um, we see this only as a down payment, but we absolutely believe in Hartford and we are done with talk. We are ready to roll, we're ready to do. So uh, I invite your feedback, your ideas, your critique. We understand that no one knows Hartford better than the people who live and work there. We've tried our best to hear that, but if there's anything that we may have missed, 
I would welcome with open arms what you suggest and what you would like to put out. And thank you for your time very much. Oh, thank you, Mr. Seinfeld. That's a mouthful. Wow. Um, uh, so thank you. I just want to announce a few uh, members who have joined us uh, while you were making your presentation. I believe our council president, uh, Molly Rosado, has joined us. And also, yes, I have. Uh, Councilman, thank you. I'm sorry. She's here, right? Yep. Yes, I yep. said thank yeah, okay. you. Thank you, Council President. Uh, we also have um, our member, Councilman uh, Jimmy Sanchez, and mm -hmm. also uh, also who have joined us are our uh, Interim uh, Development Service Director, Mr. I. Charles Matthews. So I think those are the few people, last ones. All right, I'm good. we're gonna open this up, uh, Mr. Seinfeld. Um, will you be willing to take some questions, sir? Certainly. Wonderful. I see uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Rosado, Rosado, Rosati. I am so sorry, Marilyn. Rosati uh, rhymes with spaghetti, Shirley. Don't forget. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you for Madam Chair, story. Madam Chair, through you. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, excellent uh, presentation. Um, just as a um, kind of a, a backup a little bit. Um, and, you know, I don't want to be one of those people as a lifelong Hartford resident and remembering, you know, downtown in a way that was fondly, but I will. Um, and remembering downtown, particularly before it was as residential as it is now, which we know we need for growth in the city. But how do we then encourage the neighborhoods of the city, which are many, to, because oftentimes, unfortunately, downtown and the neighborhoods do not see each other as neighborhoods. So as we look at Pratt Street, and it's fabulous, don't get me wrong, and we want to have people say, you know, and personally, I think Starbucks sucks, but we want to have people uh -huh. come and say, you know, come to some unique destinations, but let's also make sure those destinations are not so unique that people are left out from other neighborhoods. So I think we need to make sure we go into the other neighborhoods and speak to the other people and make sure people feel, you know, just as someone with, and, and my colleagues here with very diverse families and diverse, you know, ages, incomes, Etc. We need to make sure, and I'd be excited about Pratt Street. I've been in other cities where you know there's no traffic, and it, but let's make sure we are reaching out even more, you know, more than you can to make it inclusive, not exclusive. And I know that's not your goal. I just want to bring that out there. So thank you, sir. Mr. Seinfeld. Yes, um, I, I certainly appreciate that. So. Um, we view it as a, probably a two-step process. We first need to ignite because otherwise there's nothing, there's nowhere to bring anybody to. But to answer your question specifically, I think the answer is in the arts. There, there, when I say the arts, we don't just mean the institutional arts, like the museums. I'm talking about groups, individuals, um, whether it's art, arts, whether it's an exhibit, whether it's music, whether it's food. I mean, there, there's so many aspects of that. And I think one of the beautiful ideas of, of the activation, and this goes to the broader project that we're, that we're looking to do, is to tap into the diversity that you're talking about and to display the full color and, and, and talent that Hartford has to offer in its in its creativity in its in its culture and so whether it's art whether it's performances whether it's pop-ups I, I i don't want to commit but i wanted to share with you one of the things that we discussed was perhaps and again it's not a commitment it's only sharing how what we're thinking of is taking a vacant space and perhaps allowing artists to use that, I know we have been I, uh, some ideas have, have this has been uh, bounced around, allowing them to use that maybe as a rotating studio for a week or two at a time. Um, so people who otherwise would not have the opportunity to to display their art or to get out there. So we're you know there are different ideas that we're working on, um, but you know it's it's a parallel track. We have to. Uh, activate the street in a way that has a broader reach, but at the same time is authentic to the full Hartford. And we 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 are we agree with 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 your with your with your point. Yeah. Uh, Councilman, um, thank you, sir. Councilman now Mitchum. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I actually I appreciate Councilwoman Rossetti's question because I had been jotting down 
um, some questions that are maybe they're sort of follow ups that are more specific uh, to that point. So I guess the first one, I guess, you know, I appreciate what you say, Mr. Seinfeld, about um, attracting artists and things. But I mean, we also have in our city, you know, like there are West Indian and other Caribbean like restaurant operators who I'm sure would love to have a spot in there or boutiques or, you know, folks like that. And I wonder if you have a plan. You talked about attracting retail. Why Hartford? Like, I wonder if you have a plan to reach out to the folks who have already said yes, Hartford, but their Hartford is Albany Ave or Park Street or Franklin to see who you could bring in locally as a way to really build that connection to the neighborhood. I have more questions, but I'll, I'll ask that. And then I just, I'll ask if I can go again after. So that's one. And then, just, well, yeah, I'll be, I'll just ask them all. Uh, that way I don't, I don't keep hogging up the mic. So another question related is, are the, are the materials that you're, all the materials, not just to vendors, but like your outreach, your email, is that all going to be in Spanish as well? Because we are, you know, like a 35, 40% Spanish speaking city. Um, and what portion of the housing that you talked about will be affordable? Um, okay, so thank you for your questions. Um, regarding uh, the retail, regarding the retail, we have a, um, a leasing team that specifically focuses on small operators, not on the big chain national brands. So they have been, you know, they're working with, uh, through their networks. Um, and if there are, we've also spoken to Julio at, at the uh, chamber and, you know, we are networking within the uh, tools that are available. Uh, you know, someone like Julio and the Chamber and the Bid. You know, they're very in, in there. They have their finger on the pulse of the city or the neighborhoods more than we do. So we've made it very clear to them that they should s disseminate this. We're you know, I'm, little, I'm I'm printing some of this stuff for him so that he can you know give that stuff out as well. And we, we, we would welcome any retail operator that would share our vision and bring that vibe. And obviously can, have, can, can be successful. That is our absolutely what we're looking to do. Regarding the question of Spanish, um, that is not something that, um, that has not been done. Um, if it's necessary- You should do it. It's necessary. Well, uh, you know, that's something we can certainly look into, but that's not something that has been done. Regarding the um, apartments, this is a CRDA controlled. When I say controlled, meaning uh, this is, you know, and, and as of my understanding, there is no affordable housing uh, in that, um, in that uh, deal. Um, but if you want on the financial perspective, uh, we could discuss it offline and I could get you more information about, you know, about that specifically. Customer information, any other questions? Uh, not for now, thank you. Okay, I just want to add to your list, Mr. Um, Seinfeld, that uh, the city of Hartford has got a fantastic small de business development department. I'm going to give Mr. Matthews more work that you should certainly utilize uh, in reaching out to the neighborhood businesses to try to get some culture and diversity downtown. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Do I see any raise? Oh, uh, comes to Gail. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, uh, thank you, Mr. Seidenfeld. Um, I mean, this is fantastic. You know, uh, I, I, I'm thrilled uh, at, at the work that you guys have been doing. I mean, you certainly know some of the, some of my perspective. I've been out there talking about, uh, and I'm writing down all the magic words as you're talking, you know, connectivity, pedestrian experience, uh, a sense of place in history, uh, hipster and welcoming. I mean, these are all, you know, this is where we want to go, right? Um, uh, and, you know, I, what I would love to do is to clone you because Pratt Street's one block, and you know it's a much bigger city. And to the to my other colleagues' points, uh, you know we really would like our downtown uh, to you know not only service a couple of hipsters, but to 
you know, to be uh, to spread a net throughout the whole region. And, and clearly it's for Hartford, should be for Hartford, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, I have really comments as opposed to questions. Um, uh, you know, you talk about the connectivity and the connectivity, um, you know, here you've got the gold building, you gave us a nice picture of it and, and talking about getting, you know, your folks from the gold building over to Pratt Street. But as soon as they walk out of the gold building and they cross over Pearl, uh, the first thing you're gonna see on asylum is a big parking lot. Uh, and so, uh, you know, it would be phenomenal if you could somehow uh, give Conover the same Kool-Aid that you're drinking uh, and get Conover to somehow uh, recognize that uh, it would be important uh, for the city in development that they do something there that doesn't turn somebody away. Um, and, uh, you know, and I've said this before, I mean, we, we know this from our experience. When you walk down a street, if you get to the end of the street and you look left and you look right and you don't see anything, you turn around. And, and we've got too much of that uh, downtown. So, uh, you know, my comments are, uh, I hope that you can try to get Conover to be an ally. And, uh, and I know, you know, speaking for myself, and, but I imagine I'm speaking for uh, the city, uh, will help. Uh, and State House Square, uh, they need to be an ally. Uh, you know, we've got a river, but how do you get from the river to Pratt Street? You got to walk through State House Square. It's got to be inviting. And we've got Allen Street and we've got Union Place. But how do you get from Pratt Street to Union Place? You got to go through the Civic Center. And right now, that's, you know, like going through a fortress. That's like going through a penitentiary. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've leaned on and we'll encourage you to lean on uh, the CRDA uh, to do what they can to, uh, you know, you mentioned a passageway from Asylum to Pratt. We need a passageway from Trumbull right through that connects Pratt Street over to Ann Street, gets you right over to the Russian Lady and down to Allen Street. So um, I know I'm probably speaking to the choir with you, uh, but I, I felt important uh, to, to, to get these things uh, out there. Um, uh, you know, this, this is, and, I, and I, I think I mentioned this before that um, uh, one of the wonderful things about activating our downtown uh, is the extent to which this starts to then spread out to the neighborhoods. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I don't think, I, I don't think we can expect there to be tremendous economic development in our neighborhoods if our downtown is dead. Uh, but if our downtown is alive and our downtown is vibrant, that energy uh, will extend out uh, to the neighborhoods. And I know Randy Salvatore is uh, with us and, you know, he's going to be talking about Dono North and there's some connectivity that we're going to need to get from Pratt Street to Dono North, to get to Albany Avenue, to get to North Main Street. Um, so wonderful stuff. Clone yourself. Uh, you know, let's let's uh, get others on board with all of this. Uh, love to love to see this become a, a train that just picks up momentum and just keeps going. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Okay, Councilman Sanchez. Good evening, everyone. Hey, that was a great presentation. Sorry, I caught the last bit of it. But I, I caught enough to realize that um, that you and your team are, are serious about moving this forward. Uh, I do remember our conversation in the uh, working group for the uh, parking lots. I am hoping that um, Conover uh, become a part a partner with this and to uh, you know thinking outside the box as far as uh, making uh, that parking lot a part of Pratt Street and downtown and and and. and you know, to, to increase that vibrancy that, that we're looking for. Um, you mentioned something about standards. So basically standards is when you create through the, um, through the zoning uh, where, you know, every store has to have a certain type of um, uh, street front or, or, you know, fascia, right? So I, I'm just imagining, uh, neon lights I, I i come to find out I, I i come to find out that uh neon lights not everyone understand what that is they think it's a strobe light it's flashing and and blinds people no neon lights is just tools that more or less like what uh they have in new york and it's inviting it's colorful 
um, you know, it, it, it stands out, right? And these are the type of standards I'm looking for. But with these standards, uh, you're talking about interior as well. And, I, you know, I, I think that, you know, I, I like the idea. Uh, it probably will simplify everything. Um, but what's the financial burden on that for someone that wants to start a business? Wouldn't that increase the, the cost? So that's all part of the, uh, there, there's some part of it, I'm not gonna get into the details here, but some of it, um, we as a landlord are gonna shoulder. Uh, we also have, um, we have someone on staff, the designer who's gonna work with them because we understand that small retail owners, th these are not big places, you know, they don't have teams of designers on their staff who are gonna figure this out for them. So we're very, you know, it's a balancing act. We don't want to overburden them, but at the same time, if it's going to have no standard and everyone's just going to do what they want, it's going to look like the way it is. Then, then, then within a few years, the whole thing is going to fall apart. So like everything else, it's a balance. You know, we're reasonable. This is not a dictatorship. Uh, you know, the whole idea of Pratt Street is relationships. You know, we talk to the tenants. We talk to these people, uh, whoever we have spoken to. And I will say that there, you know, until until the ink is signed, I can't share anything. Surprisingly, we have seen some very positive interest in new retail to come to Pratt Street, and they and the thing that that excites them is all this because they understand what we're trying to accomplish. And then there's details like everything else. We'll sit down, figure it all out. You know, uh, I know this was a conversation a different council meeting, you know, some of the rents, you know, that, you know, you know, giving them a, 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 a period of, rev, you know, ramping up and, and working with them. You know, that's one of the things we're not corporate that, you know, nothing is etched in stone. And if you don't fit that mold, then get out of here. We're very not like that. We're extremely accommodating and, and relationships come first, but, you know, a, a retail store, right? We don't want a bank. That's not what we want, you know? And a retail store that doesn't care for this vision doesn't belong in Pratt Street. It really doesn't. If the XL Center is having an event and this store wants to shut down early, they don't belong in Pratt Street. They could be somewhere else. Because Pratt Street is, is, is meant for those who understand the community, they understand the vision, they understand how important vital it is, and they are willing to work together with all the other stores to do so. And that's what we're trying to work with. So, you know, I, the, 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 you know, if you have a relationship, you can work, we work out the details and we've done that many times. Okay. And I, and I'm looking forward to us uh, uh, viewing this, uh, the standards, because if, uh, if this standards will work for Pratt Street, I think it can be, it, it can be applied to the other quarters like Albany Avenue and, and the Brit and Weathersfield Avenue where it, it, it'll, you know, build up the uh, small community, the small mom and pops businesses around there as well so that they can connect into downtown and also bringing in and going out into the, uh, you know, the, the neighborhood restaurants and inviting them and telling them, listen, we can support you, we can help you uh, start a second business in downtown on Pratt Street, give it a try, these are the incentives or, or what have you, if there are incentives, but thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, Councilman Mitchum. Thanks. Just actually, Councilman Sanchez made me think of something else I wanted to ask specifically about incentives. Um, I wonder if, I know I asked before about trying to attract local businesses. I wonder if you have any plan. And let me say, if the answer is no, then my suggestion is you should have such a plan to to create financial incentives maybe for local business owners who want to expand into that space, especially minority owned businesses to be able to, I think councilman centers raised a good point. Like if there's a lot of standards and a lot of design issues, even if they're not set in stone, so to speak, you know, that presents costs, especially if people are thinking about. Out. So I wonder if you've considered creating some financial incentives to make sure that this corridor is representative of the city. We'll leave uh, incentives might be the, uh, the job of the government. We are a privately owned company. So there's no hiding the fact that we are a business. 
That said, we understand that for everybody's success, every store needs to be successful. We also understand and very sensitive to the fact that we're coming out of pandemic. So even a store that has a great customer base and has been there for many years is struggling now. And we've worked with all our current, uh, uh, we've worked with our current tenants, right? Um, who've shown good faith and, and work with them, right? So whether, whether, whether it's been, uh, uh, you know, rent deferments or payment plans, I mean, to us, that's a tax incentive, but we don't have, you know, stimulus. Uh, we're, not, we're, not the, we're, not, we're not the federal government and, and to think that is, is just not realistic. So you, I mean, Shelburne is getting some pretty sweet tax deals from, from the city right now on some other properties and other projects, is it not? Okay, I, I think that's beyond the conversation and the point of discussing it. Fair enough. Okay, and seeing other uh, Councilman Sanchez. Yes, uh, I just, uh, this is basically uh, just uh, for Councilman Nickham. Um, I think that that opportunity arises from the $92 million we received. I think that's where we need to uh, sh yeah. show up from our yeah. That's a good point. I appreciate that point, Councilman. Yeah. Uh, and, and by the way, Mike, I really do appreciate, you know, um, how you guys are stepping up to the plate and, uh, and helping Council and the city move forward with this. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Um, Mr. Sanchefeld, I want to thank you personally also. And yes, Josh, that, you know, that's something which I think we all should take a look and see, you know, it's not a lot of money, but, you know, let's use it on behalf of this business and the resident of the city. Um, but Mr. Sanchefeld, thank you very much for your presentation. I've, I, I think there is two person uh, on this council which you have made real happy, our esteemed Councilman John Gale. You have given you have used some buzzwords that uh, I've heard them use in different uh, committee meeting. So I know he's really happy um, with the marketing and the outreach you're doing on Pratt Street, uh, and and also Councilman Sanchez, who was always, you know, felt personally that Pratt Street really needs to be um, makeover, you know, more than anything else. And one of the couple of things which I thought um, in your presentation was was extremely um, visionary is the um, park, the walkway between Asylum and Park Street. That was a great idea if you, if you can ever make that happen. And, and yes, Councilman Marzetti, I love my Starbucks, but I also love uh, coffee. So having, you know, some, you know, unique coffee boutique uh, downtown, that will also be very welcoming uh, for us coffee drinkers. Uh, you know, and one of the things I would I will ask you, you know, as you're doing a great marketing plan for Park Street, and you said you're branching out, you know, to with the bid and more um, the business uh, district downtown, uh, you know, that's that's also marketing, you know, um, Hartford as a whole. So um, working with our development service department, if we can get some marketing, just Hartford as a whole, you know, in your plan. I think it will uh, serve, you know, everybody's needs, all the community needs and downtown Hartford. Uh, one of the things, uh, Councilman Rossetti, I need to echo what she really said. And that is, uh, you know, there's always a thought in the neighborhoods that downtown is special. Nobody goes downtown. Downtown people don't come out in the neighborhood. You know, um, one of the things I would love to see, because we have a great diversity in our city, and we would love to share that with our residents, you know, in downtown Hartford. You know, so you have a very cultural diverse uh, council. I, my suggestion would be utilize us. You know, we have, uh, you know, Caribbean, African-American, uh, you know, Peru. there was such a culture diversity that we certainly could help you also, you know, bring that uniqueness to Hartford by sharing our culture, you know, with you on your endeavors and what you're trying to do. Um, there's only one question I think, which I really have looking at my notes here, and that is the number, the gold tower and all the other apartments you have. How many apartments are you gonna be having totally come online when you finish all your projects? About 370. That includes also the temple lofts and apartments down by Temple and Main. <laughs> the, uh, the largest piece, which we're about to start now is 99, which has 97 units. And then we're going to be working our way down the down the street. 
Right. Also, I would suggest uh, to my uh, PDNH uh, committee members, you know, reach out to Mr. Seinfeld and take a tour of what they're doing. I am a very visual person and I love all these wonderful designs and stuff. It doesn't make any sense to me. I'm going to be honest with you. But if you take a tour and actually feel and see what the apartments are like and actually walk the tour with them, I think that's going to benefit us tremendously as, you know, in the next two years uh, and we, as we make decisions that affects downtown Hartford. So I did ask Mr. Fine. One last put, thing through you, Madam Chair, may I? Yes, ma'am. Um, and, and quickly, now that I'm thinking of it, back in my uh, community organizer days, you know what we used to do is we would tour developers. So as touring with you, I invite you to come to a tour with me. Yes. You know, let me take you to the places that I see that could be valuable to Pratt Street and maybe some place, I'm not saying you haven't, but some corners of the city that as a resident and, and with my colleagues that you may not have gone. So again, feel as someone said, I think our, our chair, you know, use us as resources also. I mean, I know you want to get in the car with me and have me drive you around the city. So someone will come with us and we'll, <laughs> we'll go to different places. It'd be great. We won't go just, to Starbucks. Just get though. that second shot first. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, I'm, well. all, I'm all set. <laughs> So again, I do encourage my colleagues, you know, to uh, offer up themselves like Councilman Rossetti has done to give us a tour of our, our, the neighborhood that we live in. And also, you know, um, take a tour uh, of Mr. Um, Seidenfeld um, development that is going down to the city. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was an awesome presentation. I have learned more and I've gotten more insight in what's going to happen to Brad Street. And I can't wait. You know, I was downtown a couple, about a week or so ago and there's, a, there's chairs on the street still, still no cars, but it'd be really nice to see a, a bunch of people actually really enjoying this great city that we have. And one just last thing, I just want to, I know when um, from when you design and you remodel, keeping the historic um, the historicness of the building. I know it's very costly more, but I just want to thank you for doing so. It pains me to when you know you know to so the old Sage Allen building is gone. You know those historic buildings that were built back in uh, you know 1900s. We don't build and make those you know uh, those designs as we do anymore. So thank you for maintaining that integrity of those buildings. That was awesome. Thank you. I thank everybody for your feedback. And I, I shared my email. Uh, please feel free to reach out. And thank you for having me today. And uh, be well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Okay. And so next on the agenda, we have an, another presentation. This is a educational evening for us. Uh, this presentation is from RMS uh, company founder and CEO, mm -hmm. Mr. Randy Salvatore. Uh, and that is going to be an update on the North Crossing, Dono North area right across from the stadium. I think it's got a new name for it, but I can't remember the name of it. Is Mr. Uh, Mr. Salvatore, welcome. Uh, Thank you. Do, you. do we need to share your screen with us or how would... Sure. Um, I, I have a few slides, but, um, but I can speak to it. And, um, and Mary Corsi's on here. I think she had the presentation. So if that can go up or I'll sure. just speak Mary? to it um, quite honestly is, um, is, is um, yeah. fine. Oh, you. Hi, hi. Ready to Hello? go. Okay, there you go, Mary. Okay, so um, Mr. Salvatore, welcome. And thank you very much for sharing your time with us this evening. Thank you for the opportunity to give you an update. Um, so, um, so as a background, um, obviously you all are very familiar with the plan because um, because you were integral to the process and well predated my involvement in Hartford and had um, had planned this many years before. We're simply executing the vision and have just modified it, and um, that's really our role here. So, what we're we're now actively constructing the first phase of the development, which happens to have been called Parcel C. So it's, it was a vacant parking lot right next to the old Red Lion Hotel. And the, the first phase is 270 apartment units with a 328 car parking garage, and then has retail on the corner of there where the ballpark is. And uh, we started back in September, we were doing some, some cleanup of the site, as, as you can see, um, and many of you were at the groundbreaking. And, um, and so it's been, um, it was a challenging winter, as, as we all know, in terms of the snow. And obviously during COVID, everything um, it becomes a little more difficult. But, but despite all those challenges, 
so far the project is on schedule and on budget. And so we're really excited about that. We've gotten most, I would say the most difficult part of the project done, which is of the first phase, which is the site work and excavation normally, because that's when you uncover all the surprises. Um, and we hit a lot of surprises. There's a practically a city buried under this site. There was old roads going through here. And um, evidently when they tore down the buildings decades ago, they left a lot of that within the ground. So we um, all that's been excavated up and been removed and um, crushed to be workable materials. So, so I don't anticipate any more, any more construction surprises. And those are things that we just dealt with in the normal ordinary course of, um, of construction. So, um, so as we sit right now, the garage is up and out of the ground. And um, so you can see it if you drive by the 328 car garage, we're finishing up just some finished work on that in terms of some electrical plumbing. And um, that should be totally complete and ready for occupancy if we were to need to use it, I would say in about 60 to 90 days. Um, we, we're using it now for construction parking. And then we're actively constructing the foundations of the apartment building, of the 270 unit apartment building. And that's, I would say about 75% complete now. The other trades will be on site within the next couple of weeks. And we expect to go vertical from there I would say in about five or six weeks, start framing the building. So next year at this time, we expect to have the building up um, and be doing finishing touches and um, hopefully have people within the building, certain parts of it this time next year, which has been our schedule. There's a view which Mary just showed a rendering of the building and that's the corner where the, the retail and then it wraps around down along Main Street. And then there's a center courtyard within the building. Um, many of you have seen these plans because it was part of the approval process this first phase. Um, and um, so, so again, as an update, it's, it's on schedule and on budget. And um, now we start to think about the other phases and start to, to, to move towards that. Obviously, a lot more planning work we have to do before we'll come before, um, before you all and before the planning and zoning committees. But um, we're just kind of dusting off our preliminary plans and starting to refine those and find, find um, to take it to the next level of detail. And then we'll be presenting that, I would say within the next three, four, five months. And optimistically, and as we had planned all, all along within the schedule is that as we're finishing the tail end of one of the buildings and we're leasing that up, we'll be starting construction on the next, next property. And as you can see on this map, there was four phases to the project. It's made up of a number of, a number of smaller parcels to make up these particular parcels. Um, Parcel B, we're, we're contemplating splitting that into two phases with a garage in the center, but we're looking at some different, different ideas for that just because of the scale of the project. Um, we're also actively searching for grocery operators now. We've hired a consultant. We hired them about six months ago. They're actively out there. Um, we've had preliminary talks with a lot of the different operators. We've presented a couple of different options to operators because as we got into the plans, the original plans, which predated us and then we just continued on with RFP, showed the grocery store at the base of building B in a section of it. It had planned for about 30,000 square feet um, in that building. What, what preliminary feedback we've gotten from the grocers is that it's very difficult in an environment like this for grocery stores to make it as part of a mixed-use type of a building in terms of grocers look for accessibility so that it's easy in and easy out. And most of the grocery stores in the area, other than smaller boutique type of downtown places, you pull up in your car because this is a car, car driven population. Um, while we would consider Hartford urban, it's still suburban in a lot of its nature of it. So, um, so they, they have struggles with that also in terms of being able to identify it. So it needs to be accessible to the, to the public and the idea of parking within a garage as you do find it is very difficult. People, it takes take too long and you're competing against other places. So we've put together some other preliminary schematics, moving, showing a grocery store in parcel A, which would be a standalone store where you can have surface parking and then we can wrap residential around it depending on the scale of it um, and also have other retail along that way. We're trying to present different options. What I don't want to do is box ourselves out of being able to attract a grocer because of constraints within the site. So we're offering a lot of different options. We're listening as we have these conversations. Um, it's, it's challenging time now to find 
retailers to do anything just because of COVID. First of all, they can't come out to the site. A lot of them want to see the site. They're not traveling. A lot of the grocers are a lot of retailers in general, the national retailers. Um, they're also dealing with their other challenges of their operations right now. Um, and, and the last thing that we're hearing and seeing is this is an unproven area right now. So while we're presenting a vision, they want to see activity um, here. So the farther along we get on the construction of the first phase and move forward, the more they see that this is not just going to be a pretty picture that we're going to execute the vision and that they're going to have in addition to the existing residents on the north side of town and within the the center of downtown, who we expect this to be a great market for from a grocer point of view, they want to see residents that literally walk out their door there. So um, so we're actively moving forward and you know trying to find that grocer. And, um, and we think it's vital and important to this project because then it becomes really the central hub here of connection of the neighborhoods um, as the ballpark is done as well. Um, so I'm um, just looking at some of my um, notes. I had the the opportunity to tour a couple of the council council members at the site last week and would welcome the opportunity to tour anyone who's interested at this phase or as the construction continues whenever um, you have the appetite to do that right now it's it's very much a construction site but certainly you can see it taking shape um, and um, so happy to do that now or any time in the future um, and um, so so that's I'll, I'll stop there and can answer any questions anyone has in terms of both our progress, where we see things going, um, but, but if I was to give you a summary statement, it's that we're we're, we're on on the, the track that we um, that we had expected to be on at this point, and um, and I don't expect anything to to change that fact on this first phase of the project. Right. Questions from the council members. I have a question. Oh, Councilman Bermudez, thank you and welcome, man. Go right ahead. Yeah, I've been here, but my video was not on not visible. Can folks hear me okay? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Great. So um, thank you for your presentation. Um, and I guess a couple of questions and, and one comment. And I know we met some time ago and you've presented on numerous occasions to council, but can you walk us through again, out of the 200, so 270 apartment buildings, can you explain to us again, um, who your market, who your market is? For, for renting these properties and how many are considered affordable just sure. as pressure? Sure, so so the, the easier question is the affordability. 10% of the apartments are, are affordable. Um, in terms of our market, I would say it's a very similar market to the other, to the other um, buildings that have, all, that have been predecessors to, to us. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say it's going to attract a certain demographic. The beauty of, of creating a, a new building um, or, or kind of linking communities is that we um, we expect to be very broad based in terms of that. So our marketing approach will try to try to attract all different ages and demographics and um, and walks of life. Quite honestly, within Hartford, I think today it's a, it's an interesting time now as we transition out of COVID. Um, a place like Hartford right now, um, because the companies aren't back in in the offices, it's difficult. Um, now we're not on the market, so so by the time we're marketing, it's not a not going to be a challenge for us because I expect those companies to come back. Right now, societies and cities are in transitions. Right now, I firmly believe that once things settle down a little bit and the companies in Hartford come back, places like Hartford become more desirable today than they were previously because the bigger cities are the ones that have the challenges in terms of density. They have their, their, their other issues in terms of transportation um, issues. And what you, when you read about whether, whether it's safety or whatever that might be. And so I think there's been a flight out of the bigger cities. And I think for those that have found a home in whether they visited someone or they're temporarily staying in some of the smaller urban areas, which is what I consider Hartford, um, but you're still accessible to other bigger cities. You can still get there. I think this is a great opportunity for places like Hartford to attract that. Um, and I think, and I listened to, to the to the Pratt Street. That's a tremendous opportunity for Pratt Street um, and their plan of, of executing to that. So as things start to happen, cities either they're either going forward or they're going backwards. Um, and I think Hartford had great momentum prior to this. The, he is just as all cities now and all places need to now reinvigorate and, and continue to move forward. And, and the way you show that is by building buildings, by 
by um, by market actively marketing campaigns by by just showing forward progress and and um, and I think that's that's what our challenge is going to be to market this property. But it's no different than than ever before. But I think it creates more opportunities today in terms of in terms of that. Okay, so thank you. Um, a couple of follow up questions. So when you said the ten percent affordable housing, can you mm -hmm. give us exact numbers of what would what is what would a person pay for for that affordable housing i'm going to be totally honest with you i can't do that right now i don't have those numbers in front of me um it was all it was all mapped out and it was it's all public information too i believe in part of the crda presentation i just don't have it with me but i can get that back to you on that i'm just not sure how those calculations work in terms of the the performance yeah, if so. you can have um that sent over to Councilman Bermudez or sent to sure. me and yeah, I, I can I get it. And, it, and um there's there's different parts to the calculation. Yeah. You know, I believe it's based on income limits. And so I think certain certain segments of those 10% are at certain levels, others are at others I just don't remember off top. And then obviously one bedrooms and two bedrooms are are different as well. So I I can get that to you. I just don't okay. have it have it with me. Yeah, that, that would be great. No problem. Um also what's your break even in terms of the occupancy rate? I, um, you know, I haven't looked at that quite honestly, um, nor do I hope to have, look at it. Hopefully we're going to be, um, you know, upwards. No, I could say most buildings in, in markets of, of apartments, new apartments are in the, the somewhere in the nineties percent. It takes a while to get there for sure. So that's what our expectation, our expectation is. And until you get there, obviously you're not necessarily at, um, at, at break even. So, um, so, but I would, I just don't have that calculation again, sorry, in front of, in front of me, but right. we expect to reach those kind of occupancies. It's just when you have 270 apartments, it takes, takes a while to, to rent them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And obviously I'm sure, you know, factoring in, uh, marketing and everything that is required in order to make sure that you have as many occupants in, in those units in the 270 units. Correct. Um, Another thing too, and uh, what you were referencing earlier about the grocery store. So this has been a topic that for a lot of our community has been following very closely because as you know, Hartford is a food desert. We really only have one main big grocery store. Um, certainly the Hartford Foundation has poured money into this and to making sure that we have more than one big grocery store. And of course, unfortunately, the North End has been left out uh, for a very long time, not having a grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I recognize as, as a forever Hartford resident and following this issue very closely that folks in the community who gave the, this package of what is, you know, the conglomerate of development around the baseball stadium mm -hmm. gave it a thumbs up because of the fact that there would be a grocery store mm -hmm. finally for the community. Mm -hmm. And so when I hear you say things like, you know, it's a car driven population um, and the conversations that are being had with potential grocer grocery stores, um, I, would, I would push and say, let's also remind ourselves that again, we are still, Hartford still is a food desert and we still don't have a grocery, a main big grocery store for the North End. Mm -hmm. And also let's remind ourselves that 30% of Hartford's population, 30% of our residents rely on public transportation. Mm -hmm. So this lens of looking at um, this uh, car driven population, for whom? So are we saying car driven population for those who are coming outside and partaking in using this grocery store or are we saying car driven population for those who are already here? And then of course, like the two things, like everything else in a city, they intersect. Mm -hmm. But we also can't completely exclude an entire population that has been starving to have a grocery store for such a long time. And so I just had to say that because mm -hmm. it's a very important part of this discourse in terms of the development of these parcels of land. Sure. And let me comment a little bit on that. So I don't disagree with anything you just said. I mean, I don't think anything that I said is inconsistent with that, nor inconsistent from what I've said for the past couple of years that I've been involved in this project. Um, as I've said from the beginning, I am not in the grocery business. I'm a real estate developer. And so what, what I promised and I continue to, 
to, to actively do is to go out there and try to find any grocer who wants to, to be in this place and to be able to construct something that, that works for them. Putting economics aside, economics hasn't even played, played a role in any of our discussions so far. And I've told any retailer that I've talked to is that we'll make the economics work if you want to be here one way or another, because I believe we can do that. Um, there's, there's ways for us to, to do that. But we also have to be, so, so your comments about this being a food desert, we all recognize that. Your comments about the number of people that come by public transportation, obviously that's recognizable and there's public transportation right here, right? So that's why this site lends itself towards those different types of things. The public transportation is, is accessible to this. But on the other hand, we need to make sure, and this is what I'm just presenting the feedback that we're hearing and trying to accommodate that feedback is we went out originally with a, a site that did, was not accessible to cars and was part of a building. And so if you drove a car, you had to go at multi-story garage and, um, and it was part of a building. So maybe the signage, if you're part of an apartment building, your signage only has a certain effect. So some of the comments that we heard from the retailers directly and from our consultants who we hired who do this every day of the week was, we should maybe look at other alternatives to, to that. And because in the end, we need to attract a grocer and try to accommodate them because it's wonderful for us to have a goal and to say we're only trying to service or you know primarily service another one part of a population such as the public transportation. But if a retailer or a grocer needs to increase their their revenues by if that's not enough, meaning if there's not enough of population that can walk to a store here, just as an example, and they need to to draw from a very because these are major operations that they have to put here. Then, then we need to be able to accommodate them. And so we're trying to present all different options to see what comes, comes that way. And obviously, if we have a grocery store here, it is going to service the, the walkable areas, whether from the north, from the center of town, and this development. That's why I see it so vital to that. So I don't think what, um, again, if, if I said it the wrong way initially, um, you know, I apologize for that. But, but I understand your frustration from years of being involved in this. We're, we've worked very closely with Rex Fowler on this, continue to do that. Actually, the consultant came from Rex, so he's been involved in this. So we're all working together on um, on, on this, and I think we'll all share the same goals. It's just not, um, if it was simple as just building a building and someone would come, we would have already done that because I can build the building really quickly. We need to find the, the grocer that that um, that says, this is where I want to be, and, and then we'll make it happen. So. So that's, that's the process. I'm just being totally transparent with you on, on where we are with it. Mr. Salvatore, to be honest with you, I, 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 I'm feeling just as um, the regrets like Councilman Bermudez of always wanting a um, grocery store in the city. Um, but that is one of the charge um, we would have given, we should be given to our development uh, service department. Uh, you know, we have a new director now. So I know you're a developer and basically that's your job. We have a uh, development service department that has been given a charge that knows that the community um, would love a grocery store that can also service, um, you know, the residents of downtown Hartford. And I, I, um, the uh, acting director is on, is on the call. So I'm sure that's something he will take a look at one, you know, you know, as things change in our city and as things improve in our city. But one of the things I just wanted was to thank you for, uh, thank you uh, with Councilman Sanchez. Oh, I apologize. Councilman Bermudez, were you finished? Uh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, no, the last thing I was going to oh, say. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, you know, in order to have a thriving city, we certainly need, we need to have all entry points in terms of having the most economic development that we could possibly have. We need a lot of, of movement. We need different folks um, uh, to be able to go into different parts of our neighborhood, like all, all of what has already been said. And so, um, you know, my, my comments and my questions are not intended or meant to, um, to elicit any negative connotations. If anything, it's just, questions that have come up time and time again from community members, from residents who, who keep saying like, we're, sure. you know, what's going to happen? Where is the grocery store? But um, I would personally love to receive a tour. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I look forward to to receiving that tour whenever we can do that. So sure. uh, no. and thank you for the presentation. No, thank you. And I appreciate your comments in terms of, and if there's anyone on this call or anyone else that you know that can be helpful for us, because we've kept in touch with the city on all of our search with this as well. But any of you, if you have an idea or you heard grocers looking or a person, pass that along because we'll go hunt it down and we'll try to make something work. Or, or again, if you know someone else that we should be talking to, um, we're, we're all in this together to try to find a solution. So. Um, you know, and, and I believe we will. It's just, uh, it's going to be a process. Right. Any other questions? Oh, Councilman uh, Mitchum, and then Councilman Sanchez after. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Salvatore, for the presentation. And I, I think I'm going to ask a question that might have been answered, but maybe you saw me going like this because I just couldn't really see sure. the map very well. Um, is the skate park part of the, was that one of those parcels or that's outside no. of it? That's not and part so, of one of the parcels. That's what I thought, but I was having trouble seeing it. Then my other question is, are there, and again, this may have been on there, but I just couldn't see. What is in this plan in the way of open, uh, not parking space, but like open public uh, communal space, whether it's plazas or parks or something with benches? Do you know what I'm saying? Is there any of that within this? So it, essentially the site is... It's uh, the building is built in a donut shape, for lack of a better word. So in the center of that, there's a courtyard with within the building. And there's also an outside area that opens up onto, uh, onto Trumbull Street, which will have some accessibility. So there's some obviously it's urban areas, so it's tougher to do. We'll also have a rooftop deck within the within the building as well. Um, and so so that's in terms of outdoor space. There's as much as possible that we can have. OK, thank you. Thank you. Councilman Sanchez? Yes, uh, you know, first of all, um, for everyone that's going to take that tour, if it's, if it's sooner than later, don't forget to wear some good boots. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's muddy out there. But um, it was a great tour. And as, uh, as you go over there and take the tour, um, the, uh, the drawings that um, Mr. Salvatore showed us, the Behind that building, the, the frontal retail and the apartments is a huge garage in the back as well. So that's the first structure you're going to see. Um, but on the uh, on another note, um, I see that uh, Mr. Eloy is uh, from procurement is on, and I'm not sure if he's able to speak. I, I would like to hear you know, some updates from Eloy. Um, could we finish our question, Councilman Sanchez, for the council person? I did not know he was going to make a presentation, sir. No, no, it's not a presentation. It's just I'm just curious as to, you know, some of his input. Thank you. Regarding? Uh, on the project. Okay. We well, can I just get my questions out first, and then we can go. And John, Councilman Gale, and then um, Mr. Eloy can go after, I'm, after the, we're all finished. Councilman Gale? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, um, uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Salvatore. Uh, gl glad to glad to get the update from you, and uh, uh, you know this is this is a very uplifting evening. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, starting our spring on a on a on a good beat. <clears throat> I want to mention a couple of things. Uh, really, uh, mentioning to to my colleagues and to uh, our development services team, as opposed to you, uh, which are uh, that you know the city here has to be a partner um, in in growing, and uh, we all as a council we've got to be a partner with folks like Mr. Salvatore and and uh, Seidenfeld uh, and Shelbourne and people who come forward and are willing to uh, invest some of their money in our city. We've got to partner up with them, uh, and some of the things that we can do, some of the things that we should be thinking of that strike me anyway. There might be maybe a million things out there, and I encourage all of you to come up with things, but you know, the city does infrastructure. That's what we do. We can produce a foundation as a city on which private developers can build. And, you know, that foundation, I mean, you know, you're talking water, sewers, streets, sidewalks, uh, 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 transportation, et cetera. Um, this project, North Crossing, that's what we're calling it now, right? North that's Crossing right. is, uh, uh, this is potentially the gateway to Clay Arsenal. This is a potential to having economic development in the zip code within the city of Hartford that's the poorest zip code in the entire United States. That's, I heard that the other day. I don't know if that's true, but somebody said that it's the poorest zip code in yes, the entire is. United States. 
Oh, so, 6120. Yes, it is, Councilman. So that is true. I'm, I'm mentioning this by way of saying to my colleagues and to development services, we have to do what we can as a city to make the entrance to Clay Arsenal more welcoming. One of the things that I've seen on the books, I don't know where it is, is changing the intersection of Main Street, North Main Street, and Albany Avenue. There were some beautiful designs from my perspective, people may disagree, but there were some beautiful designs for a rotary, which was pedestrian friendly, which would encourage people to walk from one place to the other. You want that grocery store? We got to get people walking from Clay Arsenal down to that grocery store. That intersection right now at North Main Street is horrible. It is certainly not pedestrian friendly. Um, and to the extent that we can redesign that, uh, that intersection, that's what we as a city can do to be a partner. I'm going to mention the Keeney Tower. We've got this unbelievable resource sitting yeah. right at the north end of yeah. our downtown district that nobody knows about. Nobody. You can ask 100 kids in Hartford what the Keeney Tower is, and 95 of them are not going to, 98 of them are probably not going to know. We have done a very poor job of promoting ourselves. And, and we need to look at how do we incorporate the Keeney Tower into Main Street? How do we incorporate that into the neighborhood to help Mr. Salvatore's project, but to help Clay Arsenal, to help our neighborhoods become more walkable, more uh, inviting? To Councilman Mictum's point, he asked about public spaces. We are sitting on one of the most beautiful public spaces and we're doing nothing about it. Can you imagine Stand, sitting around, I mean, think about Union Square in New York, Washington Square in New York, and then look at the Keeney Tower. We, you know, we've got it, but we have to exploit it. So I just want to put that out there for, for all of us. Uh, this is, you know, some of our charge uh, in all of this. So thank you very much, Ms. Madam Chair. Oh, um, Councilman um, Gail, yes, I have taken a, a tour after the clock tower was remodeled. Big chicken, I didn't go all the way up there though, but got way halfway through and I was like, oh, that looks really good, nice. But it is beautiful, really. If uh, my council members haven't really uh, called the Friends of Keeney, they will gladly give you a tour. Uh, Mr. Salvatore, I was also, um, uh, you know, have I've shared the number with the Friends of Keeney and it's a beautiful uh, clock tower that you should, you know, if, you, if you're in, when you're in the city, take a tour of it. Um, I just also want to thank you for a great presentation and also, um, you know, through Councilman Sanchez inviting me on the tour of the new North Crossing. Um, and I apologize, I keep saying downtown North, but I'm going to have to, it will sink in sooner or later, North Crossing. Uh, I'm looking forward to the baseball when the stadium is opened up again and you're finished your building and maybe you'll invite me up to your rooftop to take a look across and look at the game. That sounds spectacular. But I also want to personally thank you. There were some issues and concerns regarding your development um, with Councilman Sanchez brought to our attention uh, regarding uh, having minority representation on uh, your, um, your development in your site. And, you know, uh, I think you have gone over 150% of having minority uh, contractors on your site. I know when I was there personally, I saw it for myself, you know, and so I want to thank you and commend you and thanks Councilman Sanchez um, for bringing that to, especially to my attention. And I think that's why uh, Mr. Eli is here. Is that right, Councilman Sanchez? Because I was trying to figure out, is that the yes. reason? Yes. Ah, that, I apologize. I, I spaced for a minute and I apologize, um, uh, Mr. Eloy, I really do. But one of the questions, and I think um, uh, Mr. Eloy is uh, work for in procurement and he is the one who also manages and oversees to make sure all the developers who are getting any kind of um, federal or state or uh, funding uh, as adhering to uh, minority representation. And so uh, Councilman Sanchez, thank you very much for inviting, for inviting uh, Mr. Topping here. Uh, Mr. Topping, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Uh, can I share the screen? Oh, sure, if you can go right ahead. Um, so you're gonna tell us about the representation on uh, North- Yes, I'm gonna, 
Uh, and uh, thank you for having me. Uh, hello, Randy. We've talked about this before. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, okay, let me see, share. Okay, so uh, what our office does is we, we monitor projects for uh, three major things. One is uh, MWBE participation, and those are city certified contractors. And we also monitor it for Hartford residency and minority and female trade workers. For uh, this project, which we have uh, listed as, as construction value of 41 million, uh, the requirement for MWB participation is 6 million, and they're currently uh, tracking at 7.6. Uh, so they're at 18%, which is over, 15, uh, over the 15% that's required, which is one, approximately 1.5 million. Uh, let's see if I can move this. Can we, yeah, could you make it a little bit bigger? Can I? Uh, let me see. If you go to view, if you go to view and maybe increase uh, the, all the way up top, you go to view. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I've got a view, or maybe increase it to a certain percentage. Uh, yeah. Maybe zoom it to more. Yeah, maybe 200. Oh, oh, yeah, so we're not, okay. I'm not um, squinting here. Okay, is that better? Oh, God, yes. Okay, no. so as I was saying, uh, we're, 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 the contract value we have listed is 41 million. The uh, requirement for the project then would be 6.2 million. Let me see if I can move it over. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the and maybe that I've, I've got current MWBE contracted is 7.6 million, which is 18.5 percent, which is uh over by 1.5 uh, million dollars of the requirement. Uh, also, uh, and I've talked to uh to Randy and his team uh over the uh you know the, to this point, and what we're also are tracking. Uh, is local economy expenditure. What we have on what we have listed right now is is two is two thousand dollars, which is is not a lot of of money, but that's something that uh, uh, Randy and his team will be providing me when they're spending or, or injecting any cash into the local economy outside of what the agreement has. So we've got a, a uh, area for that. They've also contracted with a local, uh, with the Minority Construction Council. The Minority Construction Council uh, assist uh, the project and with, with minority contractor. Also, this is even though this is not part of uh, the agreement, they, they have assisted in finding Hartford residents. And there's talk with the post jobs. We're always looking for uh, that as well. And uh, we've we've had some discussion about uh, post construction jobs. Again, that's not something that uh, is in the agreement, but uh, these two things uh, is something that uh, we know that is is important for the local economy. So we uh, try we push for these things here, spend uh, spending and uh, you know just whatever it is if it's uh, buying products with a, a, a contractor, a, a business that's not certified, like one a particular uh, expenditure that I know that we've had, that uh, they've had is with uh, Hartford Lumber. So again, I'm always talking to his uh, team and seeing how we can boost that up. And uh, with the post jobs, that's something that we'll continue to talk about as we move along. In terms of, uh, again, with real numbers here, uh, uh, this is the actual, these are the actual dollars and who they're spending them with. Uh, th these are the contractors that I have listed currently. That list will probably grow. But uh, what I've done is I've taken, I've, I've, in this column, the certificate, which uh, says certificate, these are the contractors that are certified with the C city of Hartford. And uh, let me see where we are. Okay, so this is the garage. Now with the garage, there were, there were no uh, real requirements because uh, it's it, because of the structure, or, uh, which means when, when I'm saying structure, it's a prefab building 
And so it was exempted. But it, it, in spite of that, uh, there was $670,000 spent uh, with minority and women business contractors. Uh, if we go to the main building and, and look at the buyout tabulation, is 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 we have six point uh, nine million. You add the six hundred seventy, and that's where we get to seven point six uh, million dollars. So uh, I meet with them uh, on a uh, biweekly basis, and we and we talk about these numbers, and we talk about Hartford residents. I uh, anticipate and hope that we can uh, bring that number up. That's something that uh, Randy has promised to uh, work with our office, uh, you know, closely so we can get that number up. Uh, I do, it would be a good thing to tell. Uh, can I just stop you a second? When you say yeah. bring those number up, what is, what I don't understand. Oh, the um, percentage of Hartford residents. But is so. The is number. You, bring it up, but is that the requirement? So you're saying it's the requirement is not met or is? Well, it, the, the, it's, it, the major can, part. Excuse me. Can I just ask a question um, so that then you could give um, through you chair an answer to both of us. So I would like to know um, what is the percentage required and where we're at with the okay. Hartford residents? Yeah. Thank you. Through you chair. I understand, Ms. Uh, Council President. I was getting to that point too. Okay, here's here uh, here the numbers. Uh, let me see. Move this around. Okay. Uh, with the half uh, part three, twelve, twelve main. Uh, okay, let me. See. Make this a little smaller so I can sure, see so where. You can, yeah, you can maneuver around it. Understandable. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. here, here, here it goes. Here we go. Okay. Uh, Harford percentage for uh, 12, 12 main. We have uh, 6%. We're, our goal is to have 30% for minority and female trade workers, which is a different category, uh, they're at 79%. Uh, so we, we're, this is the number that we want to uh, get to 30%. And so basically what's being done right now, it, it's a 6%. Yes, and, and, okay. but, and, but let me, put, let me uh, put it in perspective. The garage, uh, was again was not part of it. We still were able to get Hartford residents, but we anticipate with the uh, major construction uh, package that uh, that number will go up. And I said I work and we work with that. You know, we meet, we talk about it every two weeks. Okay. Did that answer your question, Council um, Council President Rosado? Um, I do have other questions, but I will take that offline. I will send an email. Thank you through you, Chair. Oh, okay. Uh, so basically, um, Mr. Eli, tell us a little bit about what you do and um, you okay. know, for the city and yeah. do you meet with developers every day? I'm not knowledgeable on this. Okay. Uh, I, I just, if I wanted, can I do some one thing is just get yes, my- Go ahead and get, finish your presentation, sir. I apologize. Well, well, really, I just want to get my name corrected. Is is Aloy. Aloy, see? Aloy. <laughs> yeah. A. a and so I'm used to it. it I, it's an unusual name, and uh, and I, I'm called Eloy, Eli. So yeah, because I see E. Yeah. Okay. So Aloy. no, it's it, it's it's Eloy. All right, so, sir. Uh, what? Well, uh, our office is is charged to uh, monitor uh, construction projects in the city for a variety of uh, in a variety of areas, and mm -hmm. it all it, sometimes it depends on the funding. If it's federal pro product projects, uh, we may be limited. With state projects, we may, may be limited. But uh, in many of the projects that we have, the construction projects, we are able to uh, include the uh, what we call the Hartford uh, Affirmative Action Plan, the HAP. And the HAP has the requirements of, uh, of uh, uh, requiring the uh, developers slash contractors to contract 15% of the total construction cost to sort of city certified minority women business enterprises. 
uh, 30%. We want to see 30% as a goal, 30% of the uh, worker hours and not the workers, but the hours. And, and that's, that's a more uh, accurate uh, and, and, it's, and it's a better percentage to look at than, than, than individual. So 30% of the hours are to be worked by uh, Hartford residents and 50%, 15% of the hours are to be worked by minority and female trade workers. Uh, depending on the project, we can have what's called community benefits agreement and community benefits uh, can 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 uh, go from the, from scholarships to uh, to local students, uh, money to a local agency for uh, job development. Uh, so there's a variety of things that are negotiated by development services, uh, and then we, uh, as a monitoring office, contract compliance, we monitor it. And, and, and so we have projects where on an annual basis, we uh, contact or uh, we make sure that these things are uh, being adhered to. So uh, for example, there's one, there's a, the scholarship, one project has a scholarship. So every year uh, the, that particular uh, developer uh, provides, uh, I think it's about $2,000 uh, annually to the uh, scholarship fund. Okay. So there's a variety of things that we do, but uh, the, our, the, the uh, perspective that we, we, uh, we have, and uh, I, I believe the city has in general, when, I, when, I, when I'm talking to developers, uh, and, you know, what the uh, mayor wants, what the council member wants is, is to have uh, these development projects become a boom. It's, an econo it's, it's, it's about economics. So that's how our office looks at it. Okay. So basically on this project, and I know the project is just getting started because as I drive by there, I just see the garage. So by, you know, when you finish building the building, you will, you, you believe we'll be able to get to that 30%. Uh, we're going to do everything we can. Uh, we, we, we do have competition. We have uh, Westbrook Village, with, with, you know, that this project is competing with. Uh, Willow Creek, uh, Park in Maine, and our regular CIP projects. So, uh, you know, we, 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 we're, we're doing the best we can and, and you know, and we're, you know, who's fighting. Competition? Who's comp who's, what's the competition? Oh, the competition is these other projects have the same requirements. Oh, so, oh, so not having enough minority contract is available for everyone well with yeah, yeah we, well not necessarily i would i'm not talking about contractors right now uh and maybe i miss i, I misunderstood your question but i was talking about Hartford for residents oh so the half okay thank you for clarification okay so basically so you're competing with all these other construction that's going on throughout the city what i'm saying is this project is and but so this project is this project is. And so every project that I'm monitoring, that's that's the goal of the project. OK. And so over I mean, I know this the pandemic happened last year. And so um, uh, are you um, could you say, you know, um, if the other projects are meeting some of those requirements? Uh, yeah, I think we, uh, I, I can tell you that the hub over at Park Street, they met it. The, uh, we've, uh, Willow, uh, Bo, um, Westbrook Village, uh, has met it. We're just starting the, uh, project. We're starting to look at it and work closely with Park in Maine. Uh, the, uh, so the, that we don't have any available numbers right now because we're trying to just get them on our tracking system. We have a, a tracking system called LCB Tracker where they submit their payrolls and that's how we get our calculations. So, uh, but, you know, uh, one of the things that we also do in our office is that we work with, uh, agencies throughout the, uh, city. And, and so, for example, Sue Gunderson, uh, the two of us have teamed up uh, to, uh, and we've put together a spreadsheet and she sent, you know, we were just to recruit Hartford residents. So we put them on this list. And as we get requests from uh, contractors, uh, we, you know, we try to place them there. So she, she's, she's connected with uh, at least 20 agencies, uh, Minority Construction Council, uh, Jennifer uh, Little Greer, 
her and I talk about just a, just about every day. She's getting a uh, Hartford resident. So it's just, it's something that we're working with on a daily basis. Mr. Lloyd, um, if I just hold on one quick second. Uh, one of the things we just kind of went off track, to be honest with you, you know, we have um, Mr. Salvatore, I apologize. Uh, we kind of went off track, but I think this sort of uh, piggybacked on your uh, development. Thank you. And can I comment a little bit? I just have to make sure, a quick statement. Don't. I won't take much more of your time. No, so no, no, you, please. Yeah, no. But we work very closely with Aloy and whole, his team on this. And what, what I will tell you is, so just as a, at a high level, because there's two different standards that we're trying to meet. One is the hiring of companies. So, and that is something we spend so much time on. I've hired someone full-time in my office just to deal with this whole thing. In addition to the messaging going down to everyone throughout the organization. We sent out when we started this project, we sent out about, we got lists from the state, from the city of all the minority contractors and the small, uh, the SPEs, small business enterprises. I think it was like a thousand people. We sent it out, a bid invite. We followed up with calls. We continue to market it through all these organizations. We placed ads in the papers. And it's because of that, if you look at those numbers, while Aloy referred to, I think we're at 18% versus the 15%, we're only bought out about a third of the project. So that's where that 80% number, if you look at our detailed trades, we've bought almost every project out with a small business enterprise or a WB or an MBE, other than the framing, which is a major company that has to supply and install all the lumber, the, mm -hmm. the precast garage company, and the pile company, which comes, there's only a handful of those companies in the area that have huge equipment to do our crown. Almost every other major trade, we've been able to, um, to hire people like that. And the way we do it, as I mentioned when we were out on the site, is a lot of times the smaller contractors, I'm mostly at size, it's not even, it's nothing to do with really um, MBEs, SBEs, I mean, uh, WBs, it's the size of the contractors. They typically can't carry the full burden of being able to pay their people and wait 30 or 60 days. So we work out with a lot of these contractors, we're paying them every two weeks because we know that they need that cash flow because otherwise if they start a project on the 1st of March, typically they wouldn't get paid until the end of April because they bill at the end of March. And then a lot of these companies can't carry for that long, the smaller companies. So we also sign co-sign agreements with their suppliers to guarantee their payments and we'll do joint checks with them because I realized that that's what we committed to on this project and we're making every effort. And so far we're exceeding where I even thought we were gonna be. On the other hand, where, where the challenge is, is in the, the Hartford residents that work for these companies. So we don't directly hire the employees other than we hire laborers. And I believe we've hired three laborers on this project and every one of them is a Hartford resident because we worked with Aloy and the minority council and the other groups and tried to identify, we need to hire three people. We want to hire Hartford people. So we control that direct hiring. All of our new direct hiring related to this project, other than some of our people, which we brought up here just to do some of the site work, are Hartford people. We also put in our contracts with all of our subcontracts that they need to do direct advertising. They need to reach out to every one of these agencies. Let's say an electrician needs to hire different people that they're going to work with these agencies. So we're constantly having those discussions with them to put them in touch with the pipeline of Hartford residents looking for work to the extent that they're not already hiring Hartford, um, have Hartford people. That's going to be, in my opinion, the biggest challenge because as Aloy referred to, there's competition. There's only so many people looking for jobs in Hartford that aren't employed for companies and we're all competing for the same pool of, of people. Um, we're doing everything we can. Again, we're working with all these organizations, um, but if you all or if anyone you know has people that are looking for jobs that are unemployed in a particular trade, have them reach out to us. We'll then put them in touch with our subcontractors um, because everyone's going to be gearing up to do this project. It's just a matter of availability of labor to be able to meet the needs. Um, and that's something that we don't directly control. We can only do everything we can. And to, like I said, to the extent we're, we're hiring three people or we're going to hire a couple more, we're going to hire Hartford people. But um, but some of these other companies already have other um, employees um, that, that obviously they have. But what we can control and we have been controlling is the, the MBEs, the WB, WMBEs and the um, SBs. And I'm really happy with the way that's going. And um, 
So we're, we're going to well exceed those goals on this. Right. Uh, Thank so you. Stop there. Hey, can, I, can I piggyback? piggyback? One, one, one second. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. I think Councilman Mitchum had a couple of questions. I thought, no, you were good? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead, um, Mr. Alloy. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and one of the things that uh, our office appreciates is is the uh, one, and we talked about this early with uh, Randy, is the uh, payment schedule that he uh, planned, you know, and put together. That's key in the uh, small business arena. And so early on, we talked about that, and he said that wasn't an issue at all, and, and he understood clearly uh, the importance of that. And, and so that's good. And one of the things that he's also that he, he made mention of is that in each of his contracts with subcontractors, uh, they do have the requirement, what, what uh, I like to call the spread in the wealth. Again, he can't do it all, but all the, the, if all the contractors are, uh, have the same requirements, then it's uh, much more likely to, uh, to, to, to meet that, to achieve it. And so one of the things too that, uh, you know, we're make that uh, we're putting out there, you know, letting, talking to Randy about is hiring local businesses, local contractors, because local contractors have local residents. So that's something that uh, with the buyouts that he hasn't had, you know, done completed yet is something that we can look at is to uh, get the local contractors that have Hartford residents to uh, get our numbers up. And I say our numbers because this is that's how I look at it. We we working as as a team, and I can't tell you that it's been uh it's it's been fantastic working with uh, Randy and his team. Uh, everything I've asked, they've done. Uh, thank you, Ms. Oldo. I need to invite you back to another one of our uh, committee meetings to get some more detail and more knowledge base on your program and how, it affect, how it's affecting and what you do regarding development, um, the constructions within the city. Um, Mr. Salvatore, I want to thank you very much for the additional outreach that you're doing, uh, you know, to really... Um, First of all, let me say for Aloy to give you such a great recommendation um, of what you're doing and working with the city, uh, you must be doing a great job um, with that. So thank you. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm not sure if we have any other council members who have any questions, concerns, comments. Um, doesn't look like it. Uh, so uh I just want you to thank you again for giving me your, uh, giving you. us your time and letting us understand, uh, you know, what you're doing uh, regarding hiring Hartford residents. Uh, Councilman Benunez, did you have something to say? You're good. Okay. Uh, you know, making sure that Hartford businesses and Hartford residents, you know, are working with the site. Your site is one of those sites which is really on the main, uh, you know, on Albany Route 44, mm -hmm. Albany Avenue. And one of the things I said to you when I was there is that, you know, people drive by mm -hmm. and they are seeing who's doing the work, you know, and we get the phone calls uh, as council member says, oh, there's all minorities working on, on the site. And so I was quite pleased when you, uh, you and Councilman Sanchez invited me to that tour because I saw a lot of our, uh, I wouldn't say Hartford resident, but they were minority uh, people working on the site. And so thank you very much for doing that. Uh, and if there is no questions and concern, Councilman, uh, Councilman Gale, uh, go ahead, sir. No questions, no concerns, Madam Chair. Just wanted to note, because you referenced the yard goats, that opening day is May 11th. Okay. 705, 705 start. See you down there for a game against Portland. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Salvatore building will not be finished as yet, so we can't go to the roof, rooftop, you know, and watch the game. But maybe next year opening next day. Next opening day. Next opening day. Is that a date? It's a promise. All right. Good job, Councilman Gale. All right. Thank you. Are you going to the game? I will be going to the game, Madam Chair. Yes. Okay. I have my, I have my tickets. All right. You know? You're making me feel bad now. I'm going to have to go buy my ticket and support the Hartford, you know, Yargos for on May 11th. Are and I and, and go down to Pratt Street and spend some money there and go over to Asylum Street and spend some I money was there, on Pratt Street, as sir. all our council should be doing. I was on Pratt Street about a week ago, sir, and I did spend some money on Pratt Street, sir. You know, so I am an honoring 
my commitment to the city, to making sure we keep the money within our city. So Mr. Salvatore, thank you very much for your patience. Thank, you. uh, thank Ms., uh, Mrs. Corsi for helping us put this together. Uh, and if there is no uh, objections, can I have a motion to uh, call this committee meeting to end? No moved. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely yeah. evening. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.